What's up, everyone? Woo! Um, side note, I can't believe we're back, and I mean that in the best way possible. Like, I am so pumped to actually be back at BTS. Uh, wow. Speaking of cameras, I have some good news right up front. Uh, oh, by the way, Skull Training Project, that's what we're here for. If you didn't come in for that, you should stay anyway, it's gonna be pretty vibey. All these things we're gonna talk about today will be on the website I show you at the end. So if you're the type of person who likes to take a photo of every cool slide, I am. Uh, you don't need to worry about that this time because this is a fully open source uh, project. So the slides will be posted around lunchtime. Um, I'm gonna eat right after this, then I'll upload them. So they'll be on the site, as well as all the talking notes. Okay, speaking of which, uh, these are the things we're gonna cover today. But there's no need for me to go over them because each team member who owns each item is gonna speak for them themselves. So let's talk about what the Stolt 3D project is. Uh, before I even get into that, just show of hands so I know, I, I recognize like half the audience. Where, uh, who's familiar with the Stolt? Who's been diving on the Stolt? Just show of hands. Two thirds of the room, okay. Great, we just saved ourselves four minutes on the slides, but I'll give just a brief overview. Uh, we have a historical overview coming next. But let's talk at least, uh, you know, the, the six key tenets of reporting, right? Like who, what, when, where, why, and how? Well, who, what, when are pretty obvious. This is an expedition on the Stolte Dali, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but where, why, and how I want to elaborate on. Specifically, why, where, and how. The why is our first photogrammetric capture of the Stolte Dali, the first 3D capture that's scaled. We've had uh, previous work done of small sections in 3D. This will be the first project, uh, an ambitious one, to try to capture the entire wreck. The where is, uh, that's a trick question, it's everywhere. It's gonna be online, it's gonna be a digitally native experience. So, I mean, obviously we know where the stole is, but the where of this project, it's going to be a completely navigable site map that's gonna be posted online, and it'll have VR and AR experiences. So if you have an iPhone, you get out your AR kit, you can pinch and place the Stolt Degali on your dining room table, you can walk around it, zoom in. If you're a dive master or dive instructor, you have an STL file that you can print, a 3D printed model on a keychain, Mike's idea to give credit, and you can do your dive briefings on the boat, or you can whip it, whip it out during a dive, and be like, hey, we're here, we need to go here. <laughs> yeah, seriously though, it'll be mutually buoyant. Mike has a whole idea for this, okay? And then there's gonna be a virtual reality experience as well. So uh, if you have Steam Link, Oculus, etc., great. You can bump into walls to your heart's content and virtually dive on the stool. And those, for like everyone else, there's gonna be a 3D model in their web browser, thanks to Sketchfab, they're a donated posting for that, okay? The last one, the how, this is my personal pet project, the open survey model. Now, I'm gonna get a little bit into the why in a moment, but just to tell you up front, this entire project is going to be free as in beer and free as in Libre. It's going to be an open source project to include the photo set, the swim patterns, the lesson learned, and any uh, documents we publish kind of showcasing that. All right, let's talk about the team because I am ostensibly here as the project director. I'm doing absolutely none of this on my own. Every single person that you see on the screen has contributed an immense amount of time, effort, talent, and uh, uh, more, more time, money. The one person I'm going to introduce up front because he's joining us from Latvia is our historian, Andrew Huebner. I'm gonna tell you about his role at the very end of the presentation. Andrew, are you there? Hello. Hey. hey, you can turn your camera on too if you want. There we go. Hey. Yeah, what do you got? <laughs> he's, he's wrapping up a secret project, but I said, you know, you're still included, buddy, so he's so intent for the today's call. He gets the best seat in the house. It's the coldest in the best places. Everyone here is going to speak for their role, right? I might be coordinating things, and I might arguably have some of the, uh, like the, the photogrammetric oracle, but to that point, I am not. I am summarizing, I am evolving, and I am, uh, we'll call it a, a holistic synthesis of giants that I've learned from and giants that have mentored me. And I want to call them out. I like to do my credits at the front of a presentation and never the end because I want to keep in context where we're growing from. So we have Dr. Stella Domestico with the University of Cyprus. We have the entire Mario Lab team. They do augmented and virtual reality experience on uh, you know, separate shipwrecks. The Nautical Archaeology Society in the UK with Mark Betty Edwards. Stevens Institute of Technology with uh, Professor Kevin Liu and Kevin Ryan, respectively, were my mentors. 
Big Apple Divers, uh, our dive club for giving me a uh, stage and uh, volunteers and a community. Community is the most important part of this whole project. Nismia for capital funding and letting me dive off Coney Island and securing all the permits for that. New Jersey Maritime Museum. I wear this pin everywhere I go because Deb Whitcraft, who founded the NJ Maritime Museum, Beach Haven, it's free. Uh, she got me started on this whole journey. She probably got a lot of us here started in uh, to maritime history. Dive Voyager Expeditions Captain Maureen Langevin, Captain Steve Langevin, they're the ones who talk to me, and I'm not even, I'm sure you've got a story ready to go for that, but they're the ones who let me get started with expeditionary work. And last but certainly not least, Chasing and So Far for sponsoring this project with money and hardware, and you'll see what that's about in a moment. Okay, so now that I've spent time with credits, the Stolt de Dali, right? This, for the seven of you who haven't been on the Stolt, it's a tanker that was built in Norway. Stolt is the name of the line, that the company that actually built, that owned the ship when it was produced, and it translates to proud, like pride, and then Degali is a mountain, a valley between mountains in Norway. So translated literally, it means the pride of this Norwegian valley called Degali, right? It was built in 1955 in uh, Denmark, I believe. And it had a crew of 43. We had a really bad Thanksgiving morning in 1964, and it was hit right there off the coast of Point Pleasant, sliced clean in two, 19 souls lost by the Shalom. Credit to these photos are to the uh, Coast Guard and the National Archives, just to call it out specifically, okay? Now, what had happened, I'm actually gonna let, it's uh, John Rush, are you here? Okay, no worries, I, got, I have a speaking note. So, what had happened was the, right here at the point of impact, the Shalom had hit it, sliced it clean in two because they were both going at near full speed on a foggy morning with faulty radar. And uh, the, the watchman was on coffee break. He took a five minute break and he was returning from break when the impact occurred. It was three things that combined with the most unfortunate timing that caused the stool to be sliced in two and all those casualties. So one of the motivations, the unspoken motivation for this project is also to honor those crew members by preserving the wreck and the lessons learned have already been learned, but at the very least we can have a public engagement for that memory. So let's talk about how we're gonna make this public engagement. How are we going to survey the wreck, right? There's many paradigms of survey. I'll break this down very briefly. Once again, the full slide will be on the website. There's a lot to take in, but there's many ways to survey a site, to build a map of a site, right? And they kind of break down, if I had to classify things by, is it slow or is it fast? And is it accurate or is it good for context? I'm not gonna say inaccurate because things for context don't need to be accurate, right? So on the glacial side of things, we have trilateration, which is the exact opposite of triangulation. You're taking distant measurements to known marker points of every single artifact on a wreck site, and it can take years to decades to survey a site. And I'm not gonna speak ill of it because it is the gold standard of survey and it's where I started. We have baseline offset, which is basically 90 degree offset from a datum line. It's a little bit faster, it's a little less accurate. For real time, we have side scan and multi beam synthetic architecture, it's, it's sonar. Uh, but you don't have much accuracy with that, maybe within a few inches to a foot. What we're talking about today combines precision with rapidity. Not in post-processing, but in terms of time on the site. The stolts an exception, I'll explain why. But normal racks, you can do photogrammetry in a single day to include processing. What I hope to talk about in three years is LiDAR fusion. Uh, no spoilers on that, but we're, we're starting an investigation into uh, that tech for recreational tech divers. So what makes a survey team so we can start to pull this off? You need a photographer and you need a safety diver. These notes are for the published version. I'm not gonna read through them because we have the safety divers and the photographers here to speak for themselves and to explain what their experience is like as we pull the mission off. But for your context, each day's worth of diving is broken down into two or more scenarios. We call them contingencies. So we have a good visibility contingency and a poor visibility contingency. We define survey objectives for those contingencies. And then we have divers assigned where they're going, what they're breathing, their runtime, their total dive time, and then we review their any decompression obligations and navigation obligations. Once again, this will be on the posted slides. I'm not gonna walk through the whole table, or this will be a three hour panel. 
So for safety divers, I want to take it straight away. Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy Clarity, and I signed on to this project after somebody dropped out. Um, I was really, really grateful to be asked to do it because um, I love New Jersey Rex and it's really still the valley. Um, safety Diver is present on um, almost all underwater projects and the, while certain um, responsibilities might vary, the first and foremost one is the safety of the, the team. Um, in this case, as uh, Chris has like so um, neatly outlined, the first thing would be the dive profile. Once the photographer is in the water or the videographer is in the water, they have to be focused on just taking their photos. And somebody has to monitor the runtime. Somebody needs to know when the turn pressure is. Somebody needs to make sure that they do not have to ever look down and, um, and worry about that. That's your responsibility. It's also your responsibility to navigate. Um, it, uh, in one of the um, dives that we were doing, they were doing something called orbitals, and they were just going back around the surface of uh, the area that we were shooting that day, and they didn't really have um, a fixed reference point. So you had to be their fixed reference point. You had to be the one that was monitoring their depth, and you had to be the one that was making sure that um, they weren't straying anywhere. And there was no line, we weren't, weren't running a line, so you had to be the one that was in contact with the rep to make sure that they did not lose it. The other thing that a safety diver does is um, make sure that there's no um, conflicts with any other divers that might be on the rep. Um, for the first time that I was on, it was just our team, so it wasn't really a problem. The only problem actually was me, because my light went on accidentally, my backup light, and one of the other teams, uh, it impeded their, 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 their um, session. So, uh, But in, on another one, we were actually on a commercial trip, and there were other divers. And we had to be careful that they were not in our shots, that their lights were not impacting our shots, and um, that's also the role of a safety diver. And then, of course, it's to make sure that the deco obligations are met and that we exit the water safely. And then um, there's some other stuff, reference markers, but John hopefully will be here. And he's going to talk about that, and I think I'm just John. Thank you. Speaking of reference markers, uh, I think John had some other obligations that came up, so we're going to talk about it. And Josh is going to grab a couple, and he's going to walk around and show you. Show him the big one if you want. Cool. And he's going to walk around and uh, hand it to you. It's kind of heavy. It's also extremely magnetic, so keep it away from your pockets if you have your wallet. The reference markers, there's two types. We have scale bars and we have targets. Why do we need these? Well, the scale bars are used to take a physical, a real world absolute scale and assign it to a completely arbitrary 3D point cloud, right? So they actually have a measurement stamped on them. The markers, the, the target markers, those are just there to act as locking points to kind of help the models start aligning quicker. The photos themselves and post-processing, which we'll talk about in a moment, are aligned based off of contrast, point pairs, and then they can they do some trigonometry with parallax and you can build a depth projection. Um, that's a six-day class, so we're just gonna kind of abstract that away for now. But the target markers will help kickstart the process with predefined locking points. These are specially encoded so that the computer during post-processing can get the code from the marker without you punching it in every time to save time. This next photo here kind of shows how the computer can immediately identify them. And I want to point out we have an x-axis scale, a y-axis scale, and a z-axis scale. They do not need to be perfectly perpendicular, normal to each other, especially the z. As long as there's some displacement at least 45 degrees out, we can do trigonometry and witchcraft and extrapolate a proper scale from there. The point being, in terms of the safety divers who are placing these, we trained extensively on the arrangement. We trained extensively on how to keep the current from making them flutter off into the far distance, uh, which is why they're weighted and magnetic. And then we trained on recovery. I'll show you the bag at the very end that we Kind of designed from a tripod bag to carry them. But long story short, he'll lift it up to demonstrate. It clips to the D-ring here, it clips to the D-ring here, or if you're staged, you can go on the other side. And it allows you to extract it, lay it down, unzip the top, and then you can pull the markers off and hand them to the team for distribution. A lot of the markers also have bolt snaps, so if a diver is going to carry off, that slides at the end. If a diver is going to carry off a remote reference point, you can clip it off, swim the 100 feet, place it, return immediately as a dive team to be clear. 
Cool. Next up, we have Mike. All right, so I am the, one of the photographers of this project, or as I like to say, a human tripod. Um, so um, chipwreck photogrammetry requires thousands of images. They have to be well aligned, they have to be overlapping uh, adequately. You really have to precisely control your image path, your swim path, and that means the depth, so your level on the wreck, and you're doing that with your safety divers, helping you if you're straight on that. And your swim speed has to be um, locked in so you get a reasonable image stream um, to, to, to let um, Chris do his magic. Um, so you really have to have good control of the camera during these long swims, and you have to watch the distance to the wreck, because that changes not only the images, but also the illumination. And there is some play in that that can be um, adapted in post-production, but it's really helpful to get the images as good as possible. Yeah, of course, as I said, the video for my last talk, you have to be completely comfortable in the required dive conditions of the dive gear. You have to make on-the-fly adjustments. And you, we come up with exposure settings ahead of time to get uh, accurate uh, images that are usable by the computer, but a lot of this has to change, so you have to know what the acceptable range of ISO and shutter speed and um, aperture is to these separate images. You have to change that. That's one of the problems with the sculpt and the darker portions. And of course, you have to know these contingency dive lines that uh, Chris was talking about. Um, and um, you have to also decide when you're going to alter your dive pan based on conditions, and most importantly, when to abort the dive. Um, and uh, I'm going to have some pictures from training. Um, this, shall we show this? This is when we, stuck, when we started out. The first thing we did is we made a shipwreck. So my daughter putting together the shipwreck made from two um, garbage cans, which we sank in a pool. And um, we used that to learn how to um, take the pictures. And uh, we also learned how to direct with the ROV. Um, there's uh, Chris and Larry flying over And then we continued our training at Dutch Springs. Um, and then we all spent some time learning how to interact with the ROV, um, which uh, Chris can talk about how they do, but it's very important that divers know what to do, how not to damage the tether, what the signals, because just like divers have hand signals to communicate, the ROV has signals that it uses to communicate with divers. And there it is at Dutch Springs, there's Chris. Excuse me, Dutch Springs, we had to do all this stuff before we actually got in the water. I think they call Lake Hydra now. No, no, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, get that, get that out of here. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, planning. And, and there's a lot of talking on the boat and going over exactly what we need to do ahead of time. Um, because you know, you have to give Chris the best image possible. And um, John Reffy is not here. He's one of the two the crew members with special interest in the Salt of Gali and knows it a lot. And he's been valuable in sort of giving us a lot of the background both of the wreck site itself and the historical background. Um, and then, do I get time to? Yeah. 58 seconds. So, 58 seconds. So, <laughs> judgment. So, remember, this is a scientific, technical dive. It's not a military dive, but it is a working dive. It doesn't matter. The most important thing, diver safety. You have to know what to do. This was, was doing one of these surveys. Um, I don't know how many of you agree that divers don't have time to go into all the details, but just let it be known that we got to a portion of the wreck where there was a strong localized current, and I was having a hard time holding position. It's unlike a recreational diver, you just say, well, this is a current here, I'll go somewhere else. To have to get that portion of the wreck. And I tried for a while, I couldn't hold position well and get the images, so I took a break and swam out to the side. And as I was recovering from that, I was feeling better, um, I got a strong headache. And over the course of the dive, culminating with the ride home and the rest of the day, I had a severe headache that lasted about 24 hours. And my assumption is, well, you can get a CO2 hit from a scrubber that's not packed correctly, or you've been using it too long, or there's a failure of your mushroom valves, or gas density in people dies. Most likely, this was overbreathing the scrubber caused by me telling, I got to get this right for Chris. I got to get these images. But the most important thing is, is realizing that that doesn't matter. The most important thing is the, mission, uh, the safety comes before the mission. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm Larry Cohen and Olga Tori here, and we want to talk a little bit about the training uh, and the way we were setting up for the photography. Because, as you could see, there's no strobes on the camera. When we were doing this, uh, Chris was concerned about shadows crossing and changing as we went different images. So, unlike our normal photography, where we're always shooting with strobes and lighting is the most important thing. Here we had a shoot without strokes. The other thing is that Chris wanted us in a good visibility day to be five feet away from the subject as we shoot. 
on a bad visibility day three feet. Uh, actually, Olga and I are doing a talk on Malaysia in this room afterwards, and you'll see we use wide angle lenses, and typically we want to be one foot or closer to the subject. So this, I think, was very hard for us to get used to on that. The other issue uh, was not hard in the pool, was focus on the camera. And I'll let Olga talk a little bit about that. Hi, everybody. So uh, my issue was uh, I had a conflict uh, when I was doing this project because I had an old camera which was nine years old. So and it was not enough uh, ambient light, but the camera could not focus on uh, spots that was not enough light. So I could go maybe like 30, 40 feet from the top down, but following the below 40 feet, my camera could not focus. Again, my camera was very old. So in this case, usually when I do underwater photography, I use my focus light. Right? So I run up and I focus on the subject and take a photo. So in this case, we could not use the lights or scopes because it would put, put the shadow and start the whole uh, project. But now I have a new camera, so I can do it. So I'm going to pass the microphone. And the main thing I want to say is this is just a very different kind of photography. As Mike said, the other thing is getting the images to overlap correctly. So Chris was able to get uh, do his work in post. So the safety divers were very important to keep us on track and keep us, you know, going. Of course, with the heads up or whatever, for those of us on rebreathers, we still had to watch our PPO too and stay safe. Hi everyone, um, Maureen Steve is back there. He's making me talk because he's going to run out of here early. So. <laughs> And I, I really like this picture. This is right after we had the Voyager printed on the back of the, the stern. Anyway, um, our, our job, we're just gonna roll some video here uh, from the project itself. And I'm just gonna talk about what our job was for this project. Our job was to document the project. You know, do, you know, quote unquote, a documentary of the whole project. Um, and to do that, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. I mean, a lot of the folks that have already spoken about the dive planning that goes into place, and that also goes into place for shooting a documentary. And also, you know, safety, 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 always. You know, that's always top of mind. Um, from a document uh, videography perspective for documenting this project, um, we had to come up with a script outline. Now, sometimes the script outline isn't always written down, it's in your head. This time it was in our head. We had an idea of what we wanted to do, right? Um, and it's sort of, uh, you know, at some point you gotta do some storyboarding, you know, to just kind of like write down what's in your head. And from that, writing down that outline, you come up with a shot list, right? And you wanna have close-ups, medium shots, and, you know, uh, far away shots, you wanna have point of view shots. So you come up with a whole shot list of what it is that you want to uh, shoot for this documentary. Um, and that's, the actual shooting of the video is the fun part, right? Um, the challenge with this particular project, of course, is, uh, and, and some of the folks already talked about this, visibility, current, surge, particles. You can see particles, right? We had a lot of particles that day, and one of the challenges with, with video or even photography with particles um, it, you know, we, we're diving in the Northeast. We, we got all kinds of gear on, we got heavy mitts on and everything. To try to shoot in manual video is challenging. So sometimes we'll put things on autofocus. The problem with that is sometimes the autofocus focuses on a particle. So what happens is you're going in and out of focus if you're in autofocus. So you have to actually shoot in manual focus, you know, figure out where your subject is or what shot you're shooting and then you know and then focus in on that okay so that's a big challenge there the other challenge is you know as as uh, Larry and Olga were saying they're not using flash well we're using video lights and we can't like get in their way because the whole job that they're doing is to photograph the wreck without the light you know light with consistent lighting basically so we have to be careful that we're not shining our lights on them um, and we're trying to get you know, in front of them to shoot them, 
you know, because, you know, looking at people diving away from you is not fun. You want to see what they're doing, their faces, and, and whatnot. So that was another challenge we had. Um, and of course, the visibility, the light, the color. We did this in black and white because typically what you get in New Jersey is a lot of green water, right? And also, you can work with the green water in post-production and make it, you can, you can actually make this look really good with color, but it takes a lot of time. So, you know, our job is to document the wreck. Um, the fun part is, is shooting it. Um, we also, would, uh, one of the things you do with documentaries, you incorporate interviews, you know, whether the interviews are on the fly on the boat or post-production, uh, post-video shooting. You know, that's something else you want to do. Um, and what else? Oh, I just wanted to mention, I don't know if everyone realizes it, but like one minute of video in a documentary can take from two hours to several days to many days, right? Because you're incorporating multiple shots. You know, if you're watching, if you watch a documentary on TV, the shot, 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 shot. You're, you're color correcting all those shots. You're looking at the audio for all those shots. You're putting music on all those shots. You're putting sound effects. It's, it's a huge amount of work to do one minute video. So this is the fun part. And now you're sitting behind a desk working with your video editing software for days on end. You know, and you know, Chris can attest to that because he's worked with us several times before. Um, I think I think that's it. I'm not sure how much longer this is running, but Steve, you got anything? You want to add, Steve? We're good. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you can add two, Chris, if you want. I have three plugs to add while we play out. The first, speaking of editing, there was a what 22-minute documentary on the Stolte Dali, the 50th anniversary, and diving the ROV on the Stolte Dali. Uh, contact Steve or Maureen to get a copy. That 20 minute documentary took us, what, a year and a half? Oh, it, by the time we were actually mastered in, yeah, in, in prod? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, uh, and editing video is fun, especially adding graphics. Uh, the second call out I have is regarding lighting. So there is a third option for lighting besides diffused remote and besides ambient, which is what we try during training and that is static lighting. So for those of you aware or not aware, if you want to take notes, it'll also be in the video recording and post. The Thistleborn project, as well as several of the GOE survey projects on Sketchfab. Uh, GOE also has a photogrammetry team, it's, they, they do a class as well. They have been able to implement static lighting on some of theirs, and it's literally what it sounds like. It is a tripod underwater with a big lantern or a floodlight times many. And if you statically light a site that's deep and dark, you can do it that way. Uh, still working on the capital to sink a few megawatts worth of lighting at the bottom of the Stolte Gali, but if we get to that point, I will certainly let all of you know. <laughs> right, ROV dynamics. What do I mean by that? Well, if it wasn't implied by all the video footage and um, the M2 sitting in the front of the room, we're using an ROV on this project. There are some benefits and there are some considerations. So the benefits, Josh is going to walk around and show everyone. So the benefits, why, why are we adding an ROV to an already hilariously complicated project slash expedition? Uh, there's three immediate ones that I can think of and a few implied ones, right? So the first is a rapid pre-dive conditions check. Uh, this one's probably the most immediate and the most obvious one. When the team is gearing up on the back of the boat and the tie-in diver is still tying in, we are trying to review the dive plan and choose which contingency. Sometimes there's three or four contingency plans. And more importantly, people want to know what to expect, okay? The ROV can motor down to the stolt in what, like a minute and a half, maybe two minutes, circle around, we get live video that we can show everyone, hey, wow, the thermocline cuts off at 70 and it's, it's gin clear below, but it is really dark. Or, it's pea soup today, we're gonna to move to the close-up contingency, we're gonna do details of the, the kitchen glass house, or we're gonna do details of the board cut upper. Or, in, uh, which has only happened three times in my life, where it's just 70 foot biz all the way to the top, usually in summer, and it's amazing. Um, it also allows us to do rapid team safety checks. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, everyone here who tech dives, um, and those who don't probably know of this, 
you plan your dive, you plan your contingencies, you dive your plan, and you execute contingencies according to that plan, right? Whether it's plus five RT, plus five depth, or whether it's uh, losing a bottle. If something like that arises, usually a team's running late on their plan. And you may see bubbles on the hang line, or you may not see bubbles on closed circuit, but you do know that the team's running late, or you may see an SMB, or you may see a lift bag, but the lift bag's not where you would expect it to be. The point is we can send the ROV down, and in 30 seconds we can have video to the whole topside crew, including the safety diver who's gearing up to carry bottles down, what's going on. This thing has a 4K camera, and we have a lighting communications code as well, so they will see me approach, they will see me ask, are you okay? This in no way replaces previous training and only augments. They're still executing the plan as it would be, but now I have immediate answers to topside. No, 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 he's flashing okay. He's giving me okay. He's showing me his SPG. He's fine. He's, he's holding a, a really large gauge. I guess they found something in the engine room. Okay, all right, they'll be here. Um, or they flash their stage, and we know immediately, hey, grab that 40, grab that 40, and the uh, safety diver can go down to meet them. So far, we have not needed that second contingency, but that's what we trained to do. The third benefit, team guidance to objectives. We trained at Dutch for this, we trained in the pool with this, have not needed it on the stall, but if we dynamically change a survey target and I find some great conditions somewhere or somewhere that's in an eddy out of the current, the ROV has a predefined signal, three flashes, which is follow me, it'll motor immediately to the new survey point, and that bright neon tether is a great guideline to the new objective. So considerations. The ROV shall augment the dive team and never replace a single member. This is culturally important, obviously, but it's also important to the mission. This ROV is great as an observation device. It's great as a scout. It's not gonna do actual work underwater. I can mount a camera array to it, but nothing will replace the, judge the judgment that a diver has in the environment, period. It's used as a tool to augment a dive team. It's also used because it looks really cool, and it's used because on future projects that are inshore and 5G coverage, we're actually gonna have live streaming to various classrooms. Um, that's, a, that's a spoiler, we'll talk about that at next year's BTS. Communications. As divers, we communicate with our hands by day and light swipes by night, right? Especially this one. Um, ROVs don't really have that kind of precision to communicate with the light, and they're also a floodlight and not a spotlight, so those kind of signals wouldn't work anyway. So ROVs communicate by light pulses, and by shaking their head. Like literally, I can make the ROV pitch up and down, nod and yes, side to side, no. I can make it rotate, which means, you know, end and the dive. And we also have light signals, right? So one flash, this is a close up of a close up. One flash is both a question and an answer. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. I don't know why you'd ask the ROV if it's okay, but I will reply if you ask and I will usually be the one asking. And I will motor up the teams as they come up to the Carolina or as they're approaching the upline, just motor up, face to them, it's face to face, they know I'm looking at them, I'll just like, flash. And then everyone on the team's like, eh. And I'll just like, cool, rock and roll, and then I'll motor off to the next team. Two flashes, this proceed. It was usually practiced for, um, if you have a, a survey objective where you need the safety divers to place markers and then return to meet to the photographers who are calibrating their cameras at the time point, Usually the RV would be used to manually trigger the start of a survey. We trained with it, we haven't needed it. I already talked about the follow me flash, and then five or more, which is basically a continuous flashing, is a recall signal. If I have a thruster malfunction and I can't do the recall motion, we will simply turn on the lights like a strobe light, and if I motor up to the team and I'm strobing, that's the same thing as, I guess, what Cousteau used to fire a shotgun into the water, I think, and then a lot of dive boats in the Northeast, especially the Caribbean, have a mallet that'll hit the dive ladder. I have found from personal experience with the really strong thermoclines that act as an acoustic lens. Um, anyone uh, active duty sonar? Uh, so with the way that lensing works underwater, that acoustic signal banging on the dive ladder doesn't always make it down to the wreck. And combine that with the thick neoprene hoods, it's not always heard even if it does make it. But turning this thing into a disco party is fantastically effective. <laughs> right. So what does it look like on the wreck? You already saw some cool video. This is how it is approaching the team. This is how it is when we're actually shadowing or following the team as their virtual buddy. This is another view from the diver's perspective. And this one, I just kind of went head on to show something in particular. You see there's two light emitters. They're about 8,000 lumens, which is why we don't follow a traditional bat buddy pattern anyway. We stay above and pitch down because 
not going to turn them on maximum, and I'm certainly not going to point it directly at you all. But if these, if this is head on with a diatine as a good buddy, those lights are running, they're 8,000 lumens, it's basically it, you've just blinded everyone and no one can get shots. So traditionally, you're trained to always be level on trim and your beam of your diatine or buddy normally. We only hover above and look down as the ROV. Right, surface ops training. Josh has a really cool perspective on ROV perspectives. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. So I'm gonna talk about my experience as the ROV operator from a tether perspective. When we started this project, we had the open ROV project Trident with us. And wonderful little machine, really tired top speed, good number of capabilities, so it was great to train on in the pool. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting about this ROV was that the tether was attached to a manual crank. So imagine standing you know, on the side of a ship for four hours. Every time you need to go about five feet forward. All right, bring it in. All right, we're going out again, okay, cool. So it wasn't exactly great for you know, ocean side conditions. Later on, as we found out, the chasing had a motorized tether. Wonderful, don't need to throw my arm out every day. So we had another, a couple other topside challenges that made the, uh, the ROV a little interesting to work with. Namely, you know, boats rocking around a bunch, the glares obscuring the controller, uh, the con conditions themselves made the current, made the tether scope a whole lot, so you're not really sure if your tether's going off too far or it's too close, and sometimes even tangles. You're down far enough, you know, you know zipping through the wreck, tether gets caught in something, you're not really gonna see where it is, so you're gonna have to go have a diver, you know, rescue the ROV. Later on in the day, and actually one or two times, as we're looking at the screen, suddenly it does become a disco ball, but without the light. One of the engines decided to seize up underwater, and we had to recover the ROV that way. You know, after a couple hours fixing the engine, we were able to, you know, restart it to its wonderful little operational status. But these are the sorts of challenges you can experience when you're out at sea with an ROV where anything can break. Anyways, that's all I've got. Andrew, you uh, just um, uh, as I said, the photographer and the safety dabber work very closely together. You have to stay in close proximity and issues of low visibility. So ideally, you'd be in the same gear. You could match your dive profile to digger requirements. But because of logistics and the availability of trained crew members, you can't always have um, that. So we'll often have a CCR diver with a shorter runtime. Uh, every will have less deco obligation, a longer runtime than the um, open circuit driver. So obviously, the controlling diver. In this case, the open circuit diver would set the profile, but that results in less a finish, less efficient image capture. Um, that's especially true in the deeper portions of the wreck. So, as I said, safety comes first. Um, I guess I only have 30 seconds to say, but I have an article about mixed open circuit and closed circuit dive teams and all the considerations of that. So, I guess look at that. <laughs> well, all these slides will be on the site as well. There's the article, issue 105 from 2021. Right, so the survey process itself. This is vastly a bridge because it's a three hour intro class, a six day uh, intermediate applied class, and it takes about a year to get it. But long story short, we have to gather those photos in the exact order with those bullet points as you see and mask properly. And then we have to do a fair amount of mathematics and masking. We have to block our scaling, we have to mask out the bio clutter, do an alignment, and then we have to generate point clouds, mesh, texture map, baking the texture map, processing, post, destination, and publishing. Just casually whisking away in about a year and a half of work. Right, the workhorse. If anyone's curious to build a chassis that can do that, you're looking at, long story short, you're gonna need uh, dual Xeons to do something at this scale, you're gonna need two or three GPUs, you want about 24 gigs of video RAM and you're gonna need anywhere from one to eight terabytes of block storage per project. Right, take it away, Josh. Hi, so I'm gonna talk about things that are really not important, but also really important. Temporal anomalies, what are those? I'm gonna talk about that. This is a photo, there's quite a few temporal anomalies here, right? Anything that moves in a photo that otherwise would not be shit. Fish, light, shadows. Equipment, divers, all of that's gotta go. What that involves from my end is individually moving into one of those things and saying, all right, 
click, 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 done. I've spent about 500 hours on this so far, getting rid of thousands of fish over hundreds of photos. Lots of life, lots of life on that right it's, it's a, it's a time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, normally what you do is you take the large temple anomaly, in this case it's light, get rid of that first, then you take the fish, group that all, you know, as, to, as much as you can, then zoom into the parts of the wreck that the fish are obscuring, individually uh, mask those. A quick example of how difficult it might be to spot some fish, and that's all I've got for you. Once again, here are our intro points. So where are we now? The timeline is in the, and Andrew's called back to speak. Okay, I'll tell this part. The timeline's broken up into three phases. Phase one was defining the rack assembling and training. Phase two is where we are now, which is repeated iterations of building target chunks. Phase three is where we do post-processing and publishing, right? So here's a view from the tie-in point looking towards the stern. This is an initial dense point cloud. This is the grand unveiling. I'm gonna show you several, several chunks. You can see the scale bars have been locked in and you can start to see both the superstructure as well as the whole shape taking form. I can show you a little bit more, but only if, uh, Larry, you're next, right? Older? Okay. Nope, okay, cool. We'll move forward quickly. You can start to see the survey pattern as the diver when they were first attempting transects. This was the first dive of the season immediately after training. This is what current will do to a perfect transect pattern. It's pretty rough. After a year and a half, the same transect is much nicer because everyone's now comfortable with their equipment and comfortable with their procedures. Notice the model is so much cleaner when the transect is cleaner. Zooming in a bit closer, just to show you the amount of detail that we're starting to get from this wreck, you can see the scale bars are locked in now. You can see that the surface is defined. And if I zoom in a bit more on the first porthole, you can even see the bumps of the anemones. You can see the marine growth. You can see the entire contour as the steel plating starts to warp. Now I want to call out specifically a pattern that Jose and Amon did. This is the Ford cut that we're rendering in right now. The chunk will be aligned with that top shell. We take these pieces like Lego components and we align them together because we have to survey chunks of the wreck. Notice how it appears well lit. He experimented with off-center lighting. We had to do a lot of masking for shadows and fish. Next season, Mike is gonna implement a similar setup with diffusers. He's got some globes, some low density polyethylene globes. We're now also starting to get renders in of the stern portion here. You can kind of see that uh, lighthouse, I believe that's the kitchen lighthouse. And you can see where the deck railing starts to go and the crane is gonna be down here, the davit. And with that, with eight seconds to spare, I say thank you very much for your time. I suppose I'll have Q&A outside.